Good evening, all. Thank you so much for uh, trusting us with your time this weekend. I know that a lot of us have more pressing, important, urgent things to do, so it's a, it's a nice sign of respect that you've chose to come here. Uh, I'm MK, I'm with uh, both the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon University and the Walt Disney Company. Uh, earlier this summer, uh, around about June, we had a fun brainstorming session about this event, uh, TEDx Pittsburgh, what would it be about with the umbrella topic of power. Um, and I said, okay, power is an interesting topic. Are we talking about power like electricity? Or are we talking about power like, uh, like Santa? And the entire group went, what? P what Santa? And I was like, well, yeah. I mean, are we going to focus on fracking here as our topic? Or like, what about Santa? What about people who have power, people who have influence as a result of the power we give them? And the group said, well, yeah, no, we're going to talk about energy. But you, yeah, you, you're going to talk about Santa. <laughs> so that's how this happened. Um, now, we're not going to actually talk about Santa and the belief of Santa. That was solved in the great, yes, Virginia incident of uh, 1897. We're going to move right on to Santa as influential. And what is influence? Santa has quite a bit of influence because we give it to him. We give him power. There's lots and lots of lists of influential uh, fictional characters. Santa's on almost all of them, and on almost all of them, he's number one. But Santa's actually a real guy. He's a 1,700-year-old priest from what is now modern-day Turkey. And he did actually have a tradition of being s in service to children. And he actually did hide stuff in stockings. After uh, he passed away, he wanted all this to be secret during his lifetime. A culture around Saint Nicholas, the sainthood of this character, still sort of vaguely morphed around the topics of benevolence to children, gift giving, uh, and it became sort of an influence that people wanted to emulate, but it was a bit, bit cloudy. Um, in the early 1800s, he sort of became a little more solidified uh, with books, stories, the famous Twas the Night Before Christmas poem here. And it sort of gave us an idea as to who this person was as, as a real individual with real traits. And it also connected him more to community than to religion. Santa started developing a very specific look and feel. He became friendlier. He got the famous red outfit we're, we're also familiar with. And he became a kinder, gentler person that we welcomed into our family as friend. And we also literally welcomed him into our house. Um, aside from him uh, being a friend, there's very specific socio-cognitive benefits. There's developmental value to Santa, as there is with other fairy tales. And part of it is around the social rituals, bonding. There's a lot of family bonding that happens as a result of the holidays and the traditions that surround Santa. Children like to be involved in these rituals, and they learn a lot of important things. There's a whole section of things called pro-social behaviors. And pro-social behaviors are allowed to be enacted through these rituals around Santa and Christmas. One of the most important is, of course, sharing. Children don't really understand the notion of sharing unless they actually get to enact it. And sharing is, of course, a big part of Santa. Want versus need is a very complex sort of notion to understand. And people, children, sort of understand this uh, rooted around the holiday traditions. And they also have what's enhanced fantastical thinking. Magical thinking is a very important phase of childhood development. It helps churn those creative processes. And group-focused play is very much paramount to what happens around Santa and the rituals associated with Christmas. There's a nice sense of comfort in the things that children do. They have some pretty crazy ideas around reindeers that fly and this man who can fit down my chimney even though I live in an apartment with no fireplace. Um, <laughs> but we're, they're, we're, they're allowed to engage in this in a comfortable, warm, supportive environment. One of the things that would be very surprising to you is that as engaged as children are in these rituals, uh, this is the Christmas story, for example, that they're acting out, how not devastated children are when they find out th the truth um, of, the, of, the, of the issue. And it's because they don't feel as if society has lied to them. Um, uh, their parents, rather. Society told the truth, not my parents, so it's not a personal betrayal. In fact, they're delighted to now be included in the adult section and trusted with the secret that they can now have with other children. He's a powerful tool that nurtures social and cognitive development, particularly in a technological age where we have this terror that children are growing up too fast, they're maturing too quickly because of their connection to technology. Santa is a master of all media, television, radio, stories, music, video games. Um, and NORAD, for example, is one really good example. Santa is in a way that children engage with technologies, often for the first time, as a result of wanting to connect to Santa, but have a positive experience. NORAD, for example, was the first time a lot of children learned about radar and then satellite technology because it tracks Santa. How many other three-year-olds, five-year-olds care about radar? But Santa in the mix, suddenly they're on board. 
If I'm tweeting, and I'm tweeting to a trusted friend or relationship, um, it not only teaches me how to use the technology, but it teaches me how to use it in an appropriate way. Writing letters is key to the Santa experience. Uh, not only does it help children with their literacy skills and the structure of how a letter works, but it's also one of the first times that children get to express themselves. It's a personal form of expression. They get to frame their thoughts, focus what they're talking about. They realize they have influence. I'm going to ask for something, and I might get it. And I actually get to ask for things for other people as well. It's not just all about me. I can relate beyond my world. I write a letter to Santa from Pittsburgh, and it goes to the North Pole. There's things bigger uh, than just myself. And these are all, all very important to a child's development. Most parents are looking for role models for their children, and Santa's a fantastic role model. You want to emulate or mimic what Santa does in terms of caring, kindness, consideration. Children will foster a belief in Santa. They'll foster a belief in what he embodies, and then they'll mimic that. There is uh, the notion of why is it a value to foster this, and is there really any way you can measure this? And the answer is yes. In the U.S., over 70% of all, all adults will donate to charity during the holiday season. Gen Y or millennials, over 85% will donate to charity during the holiday season, and that's in large part due to our man Santa. There is a belief that uh, depression and suicide rates increase over the holiday season because this, this romanticized version of what reality is is not actually true or compares to what I have. And actually, that's a myth. Suicide rates and depression go way down during the holiday season. They don't peak again until the spring. Not only do we want to emulate Santa, we want to be Santa. We don't just want to be influenced by his model. Over 50,000 Americans volunteer their time to be Santa every single year. He's the most influential fictional character in history. He's the embodiment of charity, generosity. He inspires hope. He inspires giving. He inspires cognitive development. And if that isn't power, I don't know what is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>